Uh, right, good morning slash afternoon. Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas track name, um, which is Proving Ground right now. This talk is not on my phone. Hang on a second. It is shining a light into the security black hole of IoT and OT. This is Huxley. Please give a big round of applause. Yeah. Real quick, I've got to thank the sponsors because they give us money, right? All right, quick, thank the sponsors. Diamond sponsor Adobe, woo! Gold sponsors, choose three. Um, Prisma Cloud, Semgrep, Blue Cat, Prextrack. Toyota, Conductor One, it's their support that helps it all happen. Thank you if you're a sponsor, a donor, or a volunteer. You're amazing. Huxley, it's over to you, my friend. Let's all go. Great. Thank you very much. All right, so hi, everybody. My name is Huxley Barbie. I'm the only Huxley Barbie you're ever, ever going to meat. And I am the lead organizer for B-Size New York City. Really happy to be here with the mothership, B-Size Las Vegas. Really excited about that. And I'm also the security evangelist at Run Zero. Uh, but more relevant to this talk, I've had a long career as a security consultant, and most of my clients had just IT environments, but many of them, uh, more than a few, have had OT environments as well, and specifically I have had customers in manufacturing, transportation, and higher education, all of which often have OT environments. So these environments include a lot of factory devices or bus or rail station equipment, uh, campus facilities and so on and so forth. And so much of what we're going to discuss here today falls under the category of critical infrastructure and key resources uh, in the United States. By the end of this talk, I hope that you will, one, know more about OT than you did before. You have a few pointers on where to go to do your own security research on critical infrastructure. You have understanding of uh, the challenges of scanning OT networks when you're trying to satisfy CAS control number one and have a few ideas on how to overcome these challenges. Also, I'm giving out cash as part of this. Very exciting. All right, so when we think of compute, we often uh, think about laptops, servers, and databases. And this is what we would call IT devices. But this only represents a small percentage of devices, uh, chips that are manufactured. I saw this one statistic that says 90% of chips that are manufactured go into embedded devices, you know, IoT and OT devices. So it's a much larger landscape uh, outside of IT. Some of these invited, uh, embedded devices are IoT devices, which have a huge variety, right? Uh, we often like to joke that these days, even like a coffee mug is on the internet, right? So that would be an, an IoT device. Um, but it also includes like run-of-the-mill stuff, like printers, IP cameras, uh, home automation, like your Nest and whatever, uh, as well as even power supplies. Some of these embedded devices are, are known as OT devices, operational technology devices, which operate our factories, our water treatment facilities, recycling plants, oil refineries, gas pipelines, all sorts of areas that are called CIKR, critical infrastructure and key resources. Now, two points of clarification here. In this talk, I'm using the term OT. You can think of it as synonymous with ICS, industrial control systems. Uh, the second point of clarification is you'll notice there on the lower right, I have a medical device. Oftentimes people call this IOMT, Internet of Medical Things, but with the role that IOMT plays and its usage pattern, uh, it actually fits under the OT category a lot better. All right, so obviously in this talk I'm focusing on OT and some on IOT. Um, most of us are not familiar with OT, so I'm going to go over that first, and then I will talk about how uh, really, it's not even a challenge to uh, go on the offense against OT environments. I'll briefly touch on what other people do for uh, scanning, uh, defensive scanning, and then I will talk about the novel idea in this presentation, which is active scanning in OT environments, and then finally, we'll take a look at what this means for the IoT side. So, even though many of our OT environments are considered critical infrastructure, they are shockingly unprotected. But what do I mean by an OT device? So let's take a look at that first. There's actually a huge variety in OT environments. It's not like IT where most folks have a stock PC uh, either or a Mac uh, with you know, modular components. Rather, uh, there are a lot of devices that are specially designed for a specific purpose, only can be used in an electrical plant, only can be used in this factory, and so on and so forth. I'm going to walk through an example with you. Uh, to show you what I mean by OT, but just keep in mind there's a lot of variety in OT environments, okay? So what we have here is a water treatment tank, 
the contaminated water comes up from the lower left and then goes into the, uh, the, the tank and then comes out the, the right pipe over there. What you see here are two different sensors that are attached to the right side of the tank. So when the water is below the lower one, uh, the right valve closes, the left valve, uh, the left pump pumps, and so the, the dirty water comes in. And then when the water reaches higher than the higher sensor, the left pump stops and then the right valve opens up and then drains out, um, drains out the, the cleaned water after like an hour of just like sitting there for the treatment. Uh, the pumps and the valves are called actuators. Uh, although out in the field, you might find these to be integrated, so an integrated actuator and sensor. Again, there's a lot of variety in OT environments. The brains of this operation is known as a PLC, Programmable Logic, Contro Programmable Logic Controller. And again, lots of variety in OT environments. In an electro plant, electrical plant, you might have an IED instead, which stands for integrated, uh, sorry, Intelligent electric, Electrical Device. Uh, there's an HMI, a human uh, management interface. Uh, this is the panel that a technician would use to adjust the behavior of that PLC. Uh, think of the HMI not as a computer, but more like a keypad of sorts, like a thermostat in your house. That, that's really an HMI. It's meant for like, that level of technician to, to operate. It's definitely very locked down. Uh, PLCs are programmed with an engineer's workstation. This actually is a PC, although <laughs> What you often find is they will be running things like uh, Windows XP, uh, old operating systems. Uh, apparently, I was talking to somebody where he found like um, Windows 3.1 on, on a particular like uh, engineer station. So um, this is one system, okay? And at a site, you might find multiple of these systems all coordinating with each other through what is known as a DCS, distributed control system. On the other hand, you might also have a deployment where these OT systems are spread out over a large geographic uh, region, and that is organized into what is known as a SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Access. With SCADAs, you might actually have an RTU, which uh, allows you to relay between the PLC back to some sort of centralized control center at the headquarters. All right, so this is a quick tour of how a small part of an OT environment might look like. So now let's take a look at what it means to secure OT environments and how that's different from securing IT environments. In IT, we are, con uh, we are concerned with the movement of data, but in OT, you're concerned with the movement of widgets and gears and cogs and, and things like that, moving of stuff, machinery. Uh, IT vendors will uh, release products with planned obsolescence, right? So all of you have phones and laptops which are probably no more than three to five years old. On the OT side, these devices just sit there pretty much forever in internet time. Yep. All right, here's the first question where I'm giving away money. What is commonly thought of as the triad of major concerns for any security program? There you go. That's yours. All right. So conventional wisdom in our industry says that these are the pillars of, um, of, that, of concern. And now, arguably, on the IT side, confidentiality tends to rise to the fore, right? Um, most companies on the IT, like an e-commerce site, they don't get sued if their e-commerce site goes down. They just lose a little bit of money. Uh, but if they lose PII, then then of course, you know, they're gonna be investigated, they're gonna be sued in this reputation loss and so on and so forth. On the OT side though, availability is absolutely paramount. They will do everything and anything to avoid an outage, right? Now, let's talk about why this is important. For a commercial organization, uh, loss of availability means loss of revenue, right? Your, your cars are not being built in your factory, the, the gas is not flowing and so on and so forth. Uh, but also, for many of these critical infrastructure and key resources, they're regulated by the government, right? So for example, Colonial Pipeline was fined a million dollars by FISMA be because of an outage, right? So when they are not able to deliver that availability, they can be fined by the government, right? Uh, on, if it's not a commercial organization, but like a governmental or a quasi-governmental organization, what you have is a politician that doesn't want the, the bad press of you know, that particular service, municipal service uh, going down and so on and so forth. Uh, so you know, 
for one or one of these other reasons, you know, availability is far more important with that CIA triad. Uh, nearly all of uh, IT devices run on one of these operating systems, and they're all time sharing operating systems. But on the OT side, there's far more variety of operating systems that are often real time operating systems instead, which you know has real implications or ramifications for what happens when you contact it over the network and what it might do. Uh, OT, de OT devices are programmed in languages that, that I had never heard of before I started digging into this. Right? Um, ladder diagram, I have to read this out, function block diagram, sequential function chart, and so on and so forth. OT devices are almost never updated or patched. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Availability is the most important thing for these organizations. They will do everything and anything to avoid an outage. So they don't want to shut down for patching. They also want to avoid any potential extended downtime due to a bad upgrade or a bad update. Now, you might laugh here that I'm saying like IT secure by design, but relative to o the OT side, yes, IT is, is you know, secure by design. With on the OT side though, like there's pretty much nothing, right? Uh, the moment you have access to a PLC, you will have access to actuators and sensors and be able to modify its behavior, right? Uh, many of these OT devices do not require authentication. Many of them are talking plain text over the network. There's no encryption and so on and so forth. And frequently there's no governance in these organizations to remediate default users, default passwords, as well as default settings. Basically, once you get access, you, you, you own everything. Uh, IT devices these days tend to have a lot of endpoint protection or there's, you know, um, they're, they're being scanned by volume scanners and then even the network itself has some sort of network level protection. In OT, some of the industries have started introducing uh, controls and making great improvements, but in many industries, there just still are no security controls at all. <laughs> Traditionally, uh, IT devices have, some, have had some connection to the internet, but oftentimes OT environments were air-gapped. They were air-gapped, which explains a lot of what I've said so far, right? Uh, um, security through isolation, right? Not security through obscurity, but security through isolation. Uh, so oftentimes people thought it was okay for OT uh, devices to not have so much protection because in order for you to compromise that OT device, you kind of had to walk up to it to do something to it. Now, traditionally, uh, OT networks have had their own protocols, but, but, so this is the kicker here. Starting around 2005, in order to be more operationally efficient, a lot of these organizations started connecting their OT networks to the internet. So they could do remote management and, and things like that. So think about it this way. If I have a valve on a pipeline out in the middle of Wyoming that needs to be adjusted, it's so much easier if I could just, you know, do that over the, over the network as opposed to flying somebody out there in order to just, you know, f to, to, to turn the valve, right? So for operational efficiency, this started happening. But up to now, up to 2005, security through isolation was the thing. And so that sort of curtain of air gapness sort of came down and then that sort of exposed all these other problems that I mentioned uh, so far. All right, here's the next question. What is the name of this model shown in this picture? Computer. Yes, that's it. Somebody pass that over. Okay. So this is the Purdue model. Uh, it shows an ideal model of an OT network or what it should look like where there's different levels of uh, risk and controls that are stratified for the sake of security. And you'll see here sensors and actuators are down at the bottom, or field devices as they're called, right? And uh, layer one, you got the PLC, layer two and three, you have the HMI and so on and so forth. Now what's supposed to happen here is between each layer, there's supposed to be some sort of security control that adjudicates communication between those layers. The other thing that's supposed to happen is you should only be communicating with your adjacent layer. You should not be going from one to three or one to four. You can only go from one to zero or one to two. Right. Um, the other thing that, that you want to note here is the higher layers are very IT-ish, and the further down you go, the more OT it gets. Okay. Um, 
the other thing to note is the lower you go, the fewer security protections you have. You're going to find more security protection that, at the top. So what this means is if you're going to make your way and in, infiltrate into the top, it gets easier and easier for you to get down to the bottom. Right? So once you're in layer five, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. It's just a matter of time before the adversary can get down to layer zero. So sounds easy, right? Well, what if I told you it's actually a lot easier than that? Right? Uh, so in this scenario, I said you get into layer five, you work your way down to layer one and zero, right? But what if you could skip through all those layers and just go right to layer one over the internet? Wouldn't that be easier, right? Yeah, answer is yes, it is easier. So remember what I said, um, actually I don't know if I mentioned this, but no organization actually tr truly implements Purdue. That is an ideal model that most organizations do not uh, live up to. And so we have an example here of what is supposed to be layer one in Purdue, a PLC, that is directly connected to the internet. So you can skip five through two and just go right to layer one. So now you might be thinking, well Huxley, okay, it's fine, it's on the internet, but like how do I log into this device, right, to the web interface on that device? Well, you know, what, what you might want to do, uh, aside from using Shodan, of course, is uh, you could just go on Google to find this PLC, as I mentioned. Um, but if you want to log into it, what would you do? Well, you, would you just go on the internet as well, and you go and find the usernames and passwords. Remember what I mentioned before. Most organizations don't have the security governance to remediate default users, default passwords, and default settings, which means what you're going to find on GitHub is probably going to work, at least some of the time. Okay? It's all there. Uh, here's another organization, Skate of Strangelove. Uh, they're an independent group of security researchers. Uh, they also publish some of these, this type of information. So it's all there and you don't have to try very hard to find them. Now, what if you have a situation where that particular device uh, has been remediated such that it doesn't have default passwords, right? So maybe this organization did a little bit of, uh, of governance on these things and you can't just like go find the, the, the default password and just log in. Well, Remember how I said earlier that OT devices are almost never updated or patched. So what you would do then, in this case, if you can't just log in with a default password, is head over to CISA's website and find a vulnerability to exploit, right? They've basically given you a roadmap, roadmap of things that you can try out. Because most of the devices are not patched, more than likely some of these vulnerabilities are going to work. Even if that device was deployed 20 or 30 years ago. And so now you might be thinking, okay, I see that, you know, I, I can probably have some success with default usernames and passwords, and if not, I have like a vulnerability that I can probably exploit. But you might be thinking, okay, OT devices are so different from IT, like do I need different tooling to exploit uh, these vulnerabilities? Well, the answer is no, because with current tooling, <laughs> there are modules that you can use to go ahead and exploit those, those vulnerabilities. I hope that I have, I have impressed upon you that there's a real problem here with our critical infrastructure and key resources. Some of you might be thinking, you know, I'm going to go back and take a look at my plan for going off the grid because who knows, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is any organization with an OT environment should have a hard look at it. And I was being a little cynical earlier by saying like, oh, the only reason that people care about availability is because, you know, they're going to lose money or they're going to be fined or, or it's going to be bad press. But um, that in no way discounts the importance of availability with OT devices. Because many of our lives depend on water and electricity. We depend on electricity here in the city uh, for sure. Um, pharmaceuticals and, and so on and so forth. Like, so this is really important that all of our organizations that have OT environments to, to take a look at this because our lives depend on it. Um, and arguably, one of the first things you would do if you're protecting an OT environment is to figure out what you have, right? Uh, many organizations in the past have tried uh, using uh, scanners like Nessus or an Nmap to figure out what they have, which unfortunately uh, resulted in uh, major financial loss or major outages. These tend to not be published for obvious reasons, but I'm sure you speaking with your friends or others uh, might have heard about such a things. And for this reason, security teams tend to use a passive network monitor, sniffing for traffic 
uh, with, a, with a tap or a spam port to figure out what's on the network, which is fine as long as you can access enough choke points on the network. But let's take a look, look at this more closely. Right? Suppose here you have a SCADA system that is spread across multiple sites. And all the communication at these various branches are backhauled uh, to the headquarters. Well, in this case, you know, you will have access to most of the core distribution switches at the headquarters. And so therefore, you can see all the traffic um, for the devices that communicate inter-site, right? But now consider this scenario, right, where the site-to-site -site communication is not backhauled through a central location, but instead uh, they can have peer-to-peer -peer communication among these sites. Well, this is operationally efficient, right? In order for these sites to be able to talk to each other, they can be more operationally efficient. So obviously organizations are going to do this, but it makes it much, much harder for you to get enough choke points to figure out what are all the things that are talking on the network. And if you have hundreds of sites, I guarantee you that it's impossible for you to get some sort of comprehensive asset inventory. So by sticking with a passive network monitor solution instead of active scanning, security teams are uh, inviting these, is these issues, right? Not only do they get an inventory that has uh, gaps, but it's complicated to deploy. If you ever tried setting up you know, spam ports at scale, I'm, sh I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And uh, in order for you to collect all that network traffic, you need to have these big beefy hardware appliances, right? So just deployment-wise, it is complicated and uh, you get poor performance unless you spend the money. And what do you get for all that? You get an inventory that has poor fingerprinting and has a lot of gaps in it. It's not getting all the devices. Um, and the fingerprinting tends to be poor simply because the only thing that you have for fingerprinting is what's going over the wire. And so if a particular device is not very chatty, it's not you know, giving itself up, then uh, the fingerprinting tends to be vague or even incorrect. So let's dig into the reasons why active scanning, scanning has failed in the past. Like, so why, why is it that there were all these outages when people tried to actively scan the network? And based on this sort of look in, at that, uh, we will come up with the five principles of active scanning in OT. And here is the next question. Uh, packet 2053, what do we call that? Like, what is it, it has a name that's named after a holiday. Uh, the interesting thing about 2053 is that the fin bit is on, the push bit is on, the, uh, um, no, no, he, he raised his hand. Christmas tree. All right, there you go, you got it. Um, Can you pass that? All right, so scanners like uh, Nmap and Nessus, they intentionally use non-standard packets or unexpected payloads for fingerprinting purposes, right? So they'll jostle that device, so to speak, to see what the response is, and based on that response, it's like, aha, like you're, you're that thing, right? Um, this, this Christmas packet here is a non-standard packet, right? It's not something you would normally see. And depending on the network stack of that device, it might handle it, it might not handle it. What is often the case with OT devices is they will not handle it and they will crash or they will reboot or they will freeze up, right? Causing that, that, that outage. Now, the same is true when you move up uh, above the network stack. You're looking at the application itself. Like application payloads also have this issue where uh, they will freeze up or crash and so on and so forth. The thing is, programming in IT has, has benefited from decades of innovation in terms of like release engineering, SDLC, you know, quality assurance and things like this. Um, but you don't have that in an OT. With OT, they, the quality assurance is like, oh, this thing properly responds to somebody pushing a button or flipping a switch. Not, oh, we can handle arbitrary network traffic. That is completely unexpected, right? Um, also, like input checking, I think is not a thing in OT. Like uh, they, they, it's like an IT thing, but like IT applications, yes, OT, I, I really don't think they do any of that. All right, number two here is vulnerability scanners will send security probes to detect vulnerabilities, and by its very nature, this is unexpected traffic for an OT device. For, so for the same reason as previous, the previous slide, uh, OT devices will oftentimes behave very erratically when it sees a security probe. All right, let's talk about um, heavy traffic. So legacy vulnerability and network scanners um, 
they can potentially send lots and lots of traffic on, on the network to a particular endpoint. Some OG equipment cannot handle uh, that much scan traffic all at once. Uh, and so when they do, and it's partly due to the fact that they're, they're real-time operating systems, um, when they, when they see, receive that much traffic, they will get slowdowns or they'll freeze up and, and things like this. But, but there's also the issue of the network itself, right? A lot of these network devices are not gonna be able to handle heavy scan traffic as well. So in this example here, we have a mission control. In the middle, you have that pipeline and then there's like the pump over there. So that pipeline is not in an urban environment, it's actually in a remote location where they can't get Fios, they can't get DSL. All they can do is get a modem, right? And then that pump, you can't even get a phone line out there. And so what they'll do is they'll use radio or satellite to go back to the pipeline and then piggyback over the modem in order to get back to mission control. This is not the type of network that can handle a lot of heavy scan traffic, right? And so uh, what you want to do is uh, you want to be able to tune your scanner in two ways, right? First is by being able to dial down the total number of packets that you're going to send out there. But the other one is to be able to distribute that traffic smartly so that you are sending the least amount of traffic you, you, you need to to each endpoint without having an extended scan time. So fast overall scan time, but least amount of traffic uh, on those the, each individual device. And number four here, this one is extremely important. There are some devices that will crash even if you send standards compliant traffic. They're just poorly built poorly written and, and things like this. So in this case, what you have to do is uh, do something called incremental fingerprinting. So what you do is you first, you send a super benign query to that device and you sort of like understand the shape of it, you know, just like high level, like what this thing is. And then based on what you've learned, what you've fingerprinted so far about that device, then you go down this code path or that code path for the next query that you send to it. And so successively through these iterative queries, uh, where you're being very careful about what you're sending and not sending, you could ultimately get to a point where you actually uh, have um, this device uh, fingerprinted pretty well, but also avoiding any sort of situation where you have sent a particular query that might have crashed it. Right. Um, and then the last principle here is right at the bottom, don't be stupid, go slow, start small, and then, and then expand out. All right, move on to IoT here. Brady got wrapped up, I'm afraid. For one oh, really? Okay, yeah, we're, yeah. Gonna, we're gonna skip right over IoT, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, I'll be out there if you have any questions, please connect with me, find me. All right. All right, thank you very much, sorry, we, <laughs> we're already over by a lot. Yeah.